22 years of diving, 13 as a professional, uh, closing in on 6,000 logged dives, CCR diver, ice diving instructor, advanced wreck instructor, technical diving instructor, mixed gas instructor, uh, dive safety officer, expedition diver, dive resort manager. Last month, I received my first DCS hit. I got bent. Here's what happened and here's what I learned from it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Divers Ready. In this video, I'm going to talk candidly about a dive accident that happened to me last month. I'm going to tell you what happened on the dive, what happened after the dive, and then I'm going to share with you five lessons I learned from the whole experience. First, two important touch points. Number one, I am fine. I'm fully recovered, 100% yes, whilst I had to take a period off from diving. By the time you're actually watching this, I have already returned to the water and returned to the sport and career that I love. So thank you to everyone who showed concern. Big love from Big J, appreciate it. Number two, this video is not about scaremongering. I don't make shock videos or reaction videos or clickbait or the, this diver went diving and he almost died, OMG type videos. It's just not my style. I want my content to have genuine educational value for you. At the same time, I believe in just culture. I believe in the principles of honest accident analysis as taught in what I consider to be my personal Bible under pressure, human facts in diving by the counter-errorism expert himself, Gareth Locke. Link to this book in the description below. Highly recommended reading for all scuba divers. This is a real thing that happened to me. I learned from it. Hopefully you can learn from it too. So let's start with the dive then. The dive was absolutely uneventful. It was a great dive for a start. The site was the Spiegel Grove in Key Largo. It was a technical dive. I ran about a 70 minute runtime. I completed my deco obligation, cleared my computers and completed an extra four minutes of deco while waiting for the last diver to, on the line to clear. Um, you never leave the last man behind, obviously. So I waited for them to clear and we came up together. Um, I was diving uh, CCR with 2135 in my diluent. My set points were 0.7 and 1.1. My gradient factors were 50, 70. And if you don't know what any of that means, you don't have to. It's not integral to the story. The important thing for you to know is I was doing a site I have dove literally hundreds of times before. And on this particular day, conditions were perfect. I planned the dive. I dived the plan. Uh, water temperature was 74 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees C. Top to bottom, I was toasty in my five mil bare reactive wetsuit. Uh, there was 80 feet, about 24 meters of viz, very mild current. Um, also, I was fun diving, no student with me. I was just diving with a group of friends. Uh, I was well hydrated. I slept great the night before, as always. Clean living in a guilt-free conscience, my friends. That's what'll get you. Uh, and this was the second dive of the day. The first also being uneventful uh, and with about a three and a half hours of surface interval between dives. Now, I did not have a camera with me, but that doesn't really matter because like I said, nothing really eventful happened on the dive that I could show you. So there's no sort of shock footage. Um, of course, my camera died on the morning dive and I forgot to bring a spare battery. So there's that. I can show you some shots of the morning dive though, if you like, because it was pretty nice down there.
In the water, I felt nothing but awesome. I climbed the ladder, the deckhand took my bail out, I sat in my seat, I took my kid off. Then I went and had a drink of water, I hit the head, and you know, I was putting my windbreaker on and um, was chatting with basically my friends on board, you know, just shooting the shit, talking about the dives, that kind of thing. Really suddenly, like all of a sudden, uh, my wrists started to hurt hurt kind of like a sprain. I play rugby, I know what sprained wrists felt like, they felt like this. Uh, so I took a seat, I stopped talking, uh, and then my fingers started to tingle. Uh, pins and needles first, uh, and then numbness. Then I couldn't make a fist, I couldn't ball my hands up, so a little bit of paralysis set in, okay? Then pain in uh, my forearms, kind of a burning sensation, uh, and then pain in my elbows. And at that point, I turned to my friend Dan and asked for help. Uh, Jeff, who you all met in the Chop Timber video that we posted uh, a few months ago, uh, was on the boat teaching a class. He got the big green box out, and I immediately went on to O2. At this point, uh, the last of the recreational divers were just reboarding the boat from their second double dip, second dive of the double dip. Um, EMS services were alerted and by the time we got back to the dock, there was already an ambulance there waiting for me. Um, a 10 minute ride later, I was at the ER in Marinos Hospital in Tavernier down in the Keys. Um, I was assessed in the ER uh, by the brilliant Dr. Woods and then sent to the hyperbaric medicine department for recompression. Um, I was recompressed in the chamber, according to US Navy Table 6, for five hours. Uh, I will probably have to make a whole separate video on recompression and US Navy Tables and what all that means, but I was recompressed. Uh, and then following reassessment by the doctor, I was discharged at 11.30pm and my poor, long-suffering wife Karina was standing by to drive me home. We got home at 2am and I slept for 10 hours straight. That was the dive. I learnt in the days and weeks that followed that incident the following five lessons. I should say learned or relearned. Some of this information, of course, I knew, but had never had to use for myself. Uh, and there's a big difference between theoretical knowledge that, oh yeah, I read that manual, I read that in the dive book, sure, and actually having to apply that knowledge. So that's kind of a big point to start with. Lesson one, when it comes to O2 treatment, speed and duration are critical. As any diver should know, the primary treatment for any suspected case of DCS is to administer pure oxygen as quickly as possible. I was put onto O2 without hesitation as soon as I asked for help. Less than 30 seconds, mask on. I was on O2 from the moment I asked for help, the whole boat ride in, the ambulance ride I was on O2, in the ER I was on O2, and for five hours on the chamber, minus the air brakes. I surfaced from the dive at 3.30 p.m. I entered the chamber at 6.30 p.m. The total time between me resurfacing from the dive and me entering the recompression chamber for the start of that treatment was three hours exactly, and I was on O2 for about two hours and 50 minutes of that time. Before I started the recompression treatment, before I went into the chamber, most of my symptoms, 99% of my symptoms, had completely resolved just on oxygen. So the, the importance of that, of always having an O2 kit to hand, always having uh, people who know how to use the O2 kit and make sure it's in a serviceable and working condition and that it is readily available was just hammered home for me. I mean, this is something I knew, this is something we'd always practiced, and now I actually practically learnt that important lesson. Which brings me kind of to my next lesson. Always use reputable dive operators. I am certain that the speed at which O2 was administered to me is one of the main factors that I didn't have a bigger problem, that my symptoms weren't worse than they were. At the same time, I have heard horror stories from my peers in the industry of dive boats going out without O2 kits on board, of shore dives where there's no O2 kit within reach, of empty, unchecked O2 bottles, uh, even one story from my friend Tech Clark of an O2 kit being locked with a rusty padlock that nobody had the key to. So what good is that? Um, I've analyzed these dives from every possible angle and I cannot find a fault 
in my plan of my or my diving, meaning that I believe this was what we call an undeserved hit. Now, if I dived with a less reputable dive company who didn't have highly trained staff, who didn't regularly inspect their O2 kits and test them for functionality, my end result from this could have been a lot worse. Just for the record, and I have thanked the individuals concerned in person, but thanks again to Dan and Jeff and the team at Horizon Divers in Key Largo. You guys are still the best in the business. Lesson number three, symptom denial is a real thing. So there I was after a perfectly normal dive and my wrist started to hurt. My first thought was, oh, that must be from my controller straps. Uh, I have to wear them quite tight on my wrists and they ha or they have a habit of like spinning around on me. Um, so I just must have had them on too tight and cut off circulation. Sure, right, yeah, okay. And then it spreads to my hands and then up my arms. I teach decompression. I teach people how to watch for the signs and symptoms of decompression sickness. I knew I was bent and still there was a tiny fragment of my brain trying to rationalize or excuse away my symptoms as anything but. That is called symptom denial. A minute part of my ego in some dark corner of my mind whispering, not you James, you can't be bent, it can't be that. How, you, how could you be bent with all your experience? At the same time as Dan was realizing something wasn't right with me, I turned to him and asked for help. My exact words were, Dan, I think I have a problem. I need a little help here. Boom, straight on the O2. If I had sat there playing that mental game of ping pong of am I bent, am I not bent? What could these symptoms mean? My symptoms could have spiraled downward and I could have caused myself irreparable damage. Absolutely, unquestionably. The lesson is don't let your ego trick you. Don't fall into the symptom denial trap. If you think you might be bent, you probably are. And there is absolutely no harm in asking for the O2 kit, even as a precaution. Get on it ASAP, which brings me to my next lesson. There is no such thing as DCS stigma. It doesn't exist. Anyone can get bent on any dive even when executing the dive flawlessly. We know this, we accept it, we understand it, it's in our open water course. Scuba diving is an inherently dangerous sport. We know these things. There are so many variables that go into your blood chemistry and physiology that decompression theory is still an imperfect science. I feel no shame whatsoever. I obviously have no issue talking about this. In fact, I think it's important to talk about accidents and I'm 100% certain that any of my friends, mentors or peers in the industry or any diver whose opinion I respect will not think any less of me because I got a hit. I have had nothing but love and support. And whilst I consider this an undeserved hit by which, like I said, I mean, I did everything right and still got DCS. If I had have made a mistake that led to me getting DCS, the reaction from my community, from my peers, from my mentors would have still been the same, love and support, because I am human and humans make mistakes. It is actually more frustrating that this was undeserved because I wish I'd made a mistake or an error and I could point to that and say, ha, idiot, that's why you got bent because you messed that up. And then I could make changes based on it or train to improve or whatever it is. But I'm left kind of scratching my head as to what the underlying cause was. I even left my unit at the dive shop until the following day and had Dan Dawson, who is an incredibly experienced CCR instructor, look over my logbook, look over my controllers, look over my gases and see if I messed up somehow. And he didn't find anything. So the lesson here is if you ever hear a diver talk shit about someone who got bent, you can instantly discredit that person's opinion and chalk them up in the idiot column because they just don't get it. There is no such thing as DCS stigma. And my last lesson from my recent DCS incident is this. Chamber rides really give you time to think. Yeah, chamber rides are really boring. And I was in a very nice chamber. It wasn't one of those glass cigar tube type ones. This chamber is like 
if the Four Seasons hotels made medical equipment. It was spacious. There was a technician in there with me taking my vitals on the regular period. I found a novel that belonged to one of the day shift nurses uh, and read like 40 chapters, but I forgot to note down the author or the title of the book, so when I left it behind, I can't find it now despite Googling the plot, so I won't know how that story ends. But anyway, but five hours of no electronics, nothing to do but focus on your breathing, uh, gave me a lot of time to think. And the most repetitive thought I had while I was in the chamber was this. I am incredibly thankful for Divers Alert Network Insurance, Dan Insurance. There's no two ways about it. If I didn't have dive accident insurance, I would be in a financial pickle right now. No, no ifs, ands, or buts. You might be sitting there thinking, I'm a great diver, uh, I'm not gonna have an accident, I don't need Dan insurance or dive accident insurance, or I don't dive enough to justify getting dive accident insurance. Guess what? My opinion is every single diver needs to have dive accident insurance. No way around it. I had never had to use my Dan insurance before. So you might say, well, yeah, you know, you're paying 200 to $300 a year for insurance you don't use. Well, I just dodged a $45,000 hospital bill. So you can do your own maths on that, but I'm telling you right now, when it comes time for my Dan insurance to be renewed, I will pay that money with a smile on my face. Absolutely, 100% highly recommend. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Those are my five lessons I learned from my first encounter with DCS. I was very lucky. It was a mild hit, and like I said, I'm already back in the water by the time you guys are watching this. So I got very, very lucky. I hope everyone watching this video learned something from it. If you did, feel free to hit that subscribe button, give it the old thumbs up, or share it with your dive buddy. But I also wish that none of you ever, ever have to use this knowledge. I really do. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, my name's James. It was so great to see all of your smiling faces here. A little bit of a different video this week, I know but dive safe and dive often.